Hi, welcome to the sixth night of the Earshift Music Festival 2021, proudly supported by Sydney Improvised Music Association. I'm Jeremy Rose, and I'm looking forward to another great night of music featuring the wonderful drummer Chloe Kim, streaming live to you from Sydney, Australia. Earshift Music is an independent record label that features the very best in contemporary jazz creative music from the Australian music community with an international outlook. This is the fourth edition of our annual festival, and we are celebrating the resilience of artists in what has been an incredibly challenging time for musicians all around the world. We're also excited to bring you these performances direct from the intimacy of artists' homes. Now, Chloe is a really amazing drummer and composer based in Sydney, who explores influences of rock, jazz, improvised music, and the musical traditions from her, her Korean heritage. She's released, uh, she's, she's rather prolific for such a young age. She's uh, released two solo albums, Right Turn and How to Get Through, which we're going to talk about in our interview after the, her solo set. And she's also part of the improvised minimalist rock trio, Hollow Peak, who released their debut album, Summit Over, on Earship Music in 2019. She's also got collaborations including Sandcastles, which just released their, their new album, Rain Patterns, the nine-piece uh, all, all women collective, and a duo called Jack Lo. And I'm, all, I'm also fortunate to have collaborated with Chloe on a number of occasions, particularly working with her and drummer Simon Barker on Disruption, the Voice of Drums with the Earshift Orchestra, which premiered at Sydney Festival earlier this year. So I'm really excited to present you Chloe's solo set now. So sit back, relax, and see you in about 15 minutes when I chat to Chloe about her music. So I hope you enjoy.
<laughs> wow. That was really special. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank and you. And now it's a real privilege to, be, to, to, join, uh, for you, to join me. Um, so thanks so much for that performance, Chloe. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for having me. How are you going? Yes, good. Thank you. Uh, looking forward to almost end of the lockdown. I know we're almost there. I think we might have just mm. clicked over to uh, to seventy percent. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, well, let's let's talk through what you just played. Um, so you, it was a really interesting performance, and I love the combination of use of the stringed instruments, the ukulele, and you know, and the way that you kind of organically came in and out of tempo um, and it you know really built in intensity throughout I love those kind of sudden uh, sudden endings like that um, was the music based on any sort of compositional framework or was it completely improvised and you know can you talk us through what you just did yeah of course um, this one yes I did have a very minimalist compositional structure um, I don't know if anyone watching this noticed but there was four distinctive areas that I was going in between. So I did some transitions from mainly playing ukulele alone at the beginning, then the mixture of ukulele and the guitar, then just the guitar alone and ended up on a guitar and a drum set. So it was like a different combination of instrumentation so that not one of them feels left out. Um, but that was about it, really, because other than that, everything was improvised. And that's something I've been really enjoying doing these days, just having a very clear and simple compositional structure, but developing the contents on the spot when I perform. So, mm. yeah. And, and of course, I, I have a fair idea of how you've put some of your solo drum work um, sorry together um having worked with you on disruption but um it seems like um a lot of it's, it's based on kind of orchestration of, of various instruments or sounds or textures and 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 durational um sort of sectional um is that how would you say that's that's how you predominantly work for, with your solo drum set yes for sure so when i practice alone in a practice room though um I go into a very strategic and well-planned, quite strict self-disciplined way of practicing. So I would be practicing along the uh, metronome or doing one thing repeatedly for half an hour or more. Um, but when it comes to performing, I do love breaking those and just acknowledge that's the way I've been practicing. So what I had to learn technically would be in my body. So when it comes to performance, I could be a bit more creative and free flowing. So you could probably see from my movements that I love thinking of um, different rhythm comes from different size and the velocity of the actions. So yeah, when I perform, I think about movements. And when I perform, I think about the sound productions from different parts of the drums and yeah compared to say piano which has 88 keys drums seems to have only about eight different parts to it but when we go really deep into it we can get so much out of it it's like recycling the ideas recycling one drums in 10 and 20 different ways and yeah I just love doing those <laughs> We can see that. Um, and it's also what you're not doing as well, right? It's, I feel like this, this, um, the idea of restraint and limitations, you know, I've talked to a lot of improvisers, uh, you know, Phil Slater's thesis was all about limitations. And I know that that's an idea that the, the um, members of the next have really used, um, just the idea of, uh, restraining yourself and keeping to the one kind of cell or idea. Is that, um, something that, <laughs> that you really <laughs> work with? Yes, I think different gigs, especially right before lockdown, I was very fortunate to have a few different solo drum gigs. And for each drum set gigs, I would think of a big concept, just one, 
and go from there. So in a way, those were my constraints, just like what I just did was constraints between four different movement transitions. And how do you know to, uh, whether to go in and out of tempo? Is that a, kind of an organic, intuitive uh, transition or is that a, a conscious mm -hmm. decision? Um, I think when I play um, drum set, I still go into this little zone of warm up, even within the performance. So um, a lot of the times, um, I don't know, I think it's like the excitement and a bit of a nervous feeling going on to the drum set um, to present this thing to people um, that my mind goes completely blank, even though like I mentioned, I would always like strategically perfectly plan things. I'd walk on not having anything hearing or seeing. So then I would at least move my hands to see what's happening. And a lot of those times when I first touched drums, it would sound like as if I'm playing them for the first time, but within a few seconds, they will come back to me. And then some of the uh, concepts or motives that I really like in the moment of improvising, I would try to stick with them and develop those ideas. Mm. And what's so important about performing solo to you? Um, you know, I mean, let's talk about why you decided to create solo albums and, and what's your musical process been in creating those right turn and how to get through. Mm. Um, definitely at the beginning, my teacher, Dr. Simon Barker has been the biggest influence um, for me to also look into solo drumming alone. Um, but then the more I do it, I recognized a lot of different people in the world do the same thing, but they all have different color preparations or texture preparations. So I also just purely wanted to join the crew and <laughs> experiment how my solo drumming would sound like. But it also um, was a really good way for me to start improvising um, because I used to improvise with groups of friends. And then a few years ago, I did face a time that I just kind of lost the point of improvising because I've been doing it quite often. Um, so I thought, if if it's by myself, if it's by myself practicing solo drum set performance and if it's by myself organizing the schedule and booking the recording studio and paying it by my own, I just thought if I could make all the decisions alone, maybe I would be happy with the end result because I am responsible for everything. I can't blame anyone. <laughs> yes, I think that was my entry. Um, then I came out with these little concepts that I didn't foresee when I entered into those zones. And I always think having some form, some style of finished product in creative ideas is really important because otherwise it'll be endless journey of creative ideas. But in order to mark those, I decided to make the first solo drum album, Right Turn, in 2019. And then my second one called How to Get Through This Year. And for those at home, let's let's talk through some of your influences, um, just to give them a bit of background on on, on how you got to where, where you are now as, as a performer and improviser. Mm, absolutely. Uh, like I have mentioned, Dr. Simon Barker has been the one who actually introduced me back to my heritage um, traditional music, so Korean traditional drumming. Um, and from there, I got to meet this beautiful Korean traditional singing Pansori singer, Pei Dong, who a lot of Australian improvisers are friends with. And those two figures has been a strong core for me to really um, set my mind to practicing and enjoying performing. So not only thinking about music, but also putting them into actions, practicing. So those were two main influences for me. 
And I was also very fortunate to have been involved um, being part of the Australian Art Orchestra's activities over the past few years and a lot of beautiful young and um, existing musicians I got to be friends with and pretty much friends that I've met in Australia have all individually influenced my growing as an artist. And, and it feels that, um, that these, these mentors and, and role models have sort of created a, a pathway or a process of playing rather than a stylistic influence. Like it seems like you're kind of absorbing your own uh, musical, uh, musical stylistic influences on, uh, of your own. Would you, would you say that that kind of sets you apart from what they do? Now I would be able to say yes to that. But a few years ago, um, I was copying what I was hearing. I was imitating a lot of musicians I love listening to. Um, even unconsciously, I was copying them. But yeah, I <laughs> had an opportunity to face the reality um, and just realized I shouldn't be doing that. It's not only disrespectful for the people that I really respect, um, but also it's disrespectful for myself as well. It's undermining my um, potential or it's undermining activity of, yeah, just not really respecting my own creative ideas. So I think I definitely try to get away from that zone uh, mm. by actually cho choosing some people to not listen to for a few months of period just so that I could completely um, when I moved to Australia and when I moved to Sydney in 2016 that was the proper and official beginning of my musical journey so my first encounters to creative personalized music was the only influences I had. So it was very organic that I decided to imitate existing music, but it was also organic for me to decide I should stop that. So, yeah. Well, it's a big step. Uh, and, um, and of course, uh, I was fortunate enough to, to bring you, both you and Simon together in the, the disruption project, uh, which was just an amazing experience. Um, but I mean, what was it like? I mean, I've already talked to you about this before, but <laughs> what was it like to have your, your solo drum music arranged? Um, and what was it like to, to play on stage, um, you know, with, with Simon? Mm. Um, I think at first, uh, I definitely enjoyed the concept of it. But when it came to Jeremy, I started talking about how are we going to sort this out? I think I was a little bit um, concerned in a way because um, the way I arranged drum composition was very specifically in the context of drum set and to bring that suitable for eight different instrumentalists. Um, I think in my head it was a bit confusing at the earlier stage, mm. but definitely talking to you about it a lot back and forth was helpful and just uh, getting reminded that it wasn't to play my solo drum set album exactly how I recorded it but just to bring those as an initiation of group playing music um, was very helpful to kind of unfold um, different ideas so I really That's enjoyed it, it. Mm. yeah yeah good mm. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to playing that, that, that project again. And, you know, unfortunately the, the recording was disrupted, uh, yes. it was a lot, right? but, um, I guess hopefully by the end of the year and, and of course we were meant to play in Melbourne, uh, Friday week, Friday, the 15th of yes. October, but, um, you know, that's, that's all been postponed, but hopefully we'll, we'll be up to stage again soon. Um, Let's uh, let's talk about um, your experience of um, doing these these uh, live streamed uh, well live streamed interviews, but pre-record uh, uh, performance. So you know why did you decide to pre-record and um, 
do you think it impacts the novelty of, of the experience of, of performing in general? Mm. Um, I decided to pre-record my set because I'm living in a student accommodation with 40 other people. And it's been challenging, but we're very, very lucky to be really respectful to each other and have been staying safe despite of these uh, pandemic. But saying that uh, the noise exists in this building constantly. And so there's no promising time for me to uh, just set aside and tell everyone to not come into the room where I recorded it. <laughs> so I thought it would be safe to to pre-recording. But about the nature of it, I mean, it was actually my first time doing it. And because the past few years, I've only spent time and energy figuring out the uh, sound production on the acoustic drum set, I didn't spend time learning anything to do with techniques. But as we all know, drum set recording is like complicated because there are different parts to it. Each different parts of drum set makes different volume. Um, so I was really lucky to have two of my housemates on board helping me with it. Um, but yeah, at first it made me think, oh, I can't believe this, there's pandemic and now Everyone's expecting musicians to know these new technology um, to pick up and jump on the board. But then I started to think, but this would be a good new way of opening up new possibilities um, for what it seemed to be impossible before. So, for example, next month I would be lucky to be on one of the radio stations in Chicago to present my work in this format. So that's a new possibility that I didn't think of a few months ago. Mm. And learning about the technology, I'm sure it will help my understanding on the actual uh, practical knowledge on the drum set in a new perspective. So at first I thought may, might not work, but now uh, I'm positive with this experience it's hmm. good it's good and um advocacy for uh, uh gender representation in jazz and improvised music is is a uh, important thing to you can you can you talk uh about why why that is and, and what you're doing to sort of champion greater representation in the music industry hmm. um i think i'm very very lucky to be surrounded by people who um, respect me as a person and my music but I have also experienced some negative side of um, conflicts purely because of my gender and race and age as well and I thought um, if everyone in the community internationally and domestically trying to encourage more participation and actions from young female musicians. Um, the catalyst for those actions to evolve even further and faster would be support from individuals and community. So yeah, I've been thinking about it. I've been encouraging not only myself, but also some of the younger female musicians that I get, get to spend time with to actively be in the scene and present their ideas and be confident with their ideas because all the ideas are good ideas, musically speaking. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think I, I feel very fortunate and lucky to have these different platforms and opportunities to just remind everyone that it's important, no matter how small or big the actions are, encouraging um, female and gender ma marginalized musicians, encouraging them, supporting them in any ways is crucial. Hmm. That's fantastic. Um, well, let's, let's um, 
let's just hear about what you've got coming up, Chloe, um, before we before we wrap it up. So, mm. um, what's coming up next? I'm sure there will be gigs coming up soon. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't have any specific um, gig plan <laughs> that's uh, set now, but they will come, and I'm really excited to be back. Well, let's let's plug let's plug your recent releases then. So, so your two uh, solo albums they're out through uh, Bandcamp and um, People right. Sound, Jacques Emery, fantastic label. And uh, make sure you check out Hollow Peak and your recent release Sandcastle. So, once again, thanks so much, Chloe. Uh, that was a really fantastic uh, performance. Thank you, Jeremy. And great chatting. And thank with you, everyone. You. Yeah, you too. Thanks a lot. <laughs> um, let's see on the chat. We've got um, so Lucy East. Great to hear about the machinations of your creativity. Thank you, Chloe. I understand a lot of your way of thinking. Very refreshing. So thanks yeah. to everyone out at home. It's been um, been tuning in. And uh, tomorrow night we're going to be joined by Kristen Barati. So um, look forward to that. And uh, see you all soon. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>